Uh, okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to Phosphor G. I'm going to talk about CubeSats today, uh, and specifically Phosphor G and uh, something that we put together called CubeSatData.com. So first off, let's just talk a little bit about CubeSats. So there's actually this great PDF that NASA put out called CubeSat 101. So if you're interested in launching your own CubeSat, this is a great resource to check out. It'll tell you everything that you need to know about the CubeSat specification. So what is a CubeSat exactly? So the CubeSat um, is actually a specification that, again, was released by, it, the PDF um, was put out by NASA, but it's actually um, was, an, was put out by the, uh, I don't know, some university, I, I can't remember. Um, and they put out the specification so that CubeSats could be more easily mass produced uh, and, and, and launched easier and put up into space for a much lower cost. And the design specification, you can also, it's free, freely downloadable. Um, here, we're, uh, some of the, something didn't come out there, but um, satellites are categorized by the mass. Now, CubeSats, what we're talking about here, are actually the, in the nano satellite range. So when we mention CubeSats, we're generally talking about satellites that are about one kilogram to 10 kilograms at the most. Most of them are gonna be about perhaps two to three kilograms. Uh, that size can have an impact on the lifespan and the exact orbit of the, of the CubeSat. Um, but generally, we're talking about the nanosats. The, um, the Femto, Atto, and Zepto satellites, those are, are generally like not, those are really, if those have been successfully launched, uh, they will, would generally last a very short period of time, uh, perhaps on the order of days. Oh, there we go, nanosatellites, okay. Uh, so na uh, CubeSats are specified by their size in terms of U, that's, the, that's one unit, and it's a cube, CubeSats, but you're not limited to just a single one U cube. You can actually um, put those together in, in any sort of shape that you want, down to a quarter of a U, and up to 16 U, and we're actually, I believe, gonna have 20 U uh, deployment uh, mechanisms available fairly soon. So when it comes to launching these things, the way that things used to be done, now things are a little bit more advanced, but you used to put them up to the space station, and they literally would open up a window and throw them outside. So there's a space station there, you can watch it. There's some great videos of Planet uh, putting out their early uh, satellites, and that, that's essentially what they did, throw them out the window. But the CubeSat specification and the sizes, uh, these are, this is pretty much like, like a container ship, allows you to uh, pack a lot of stuff into one container. Everything is exactly the same size, and so we have a better way to do it. We have these dispenser systems. Uh, and they're kind of just bolted onto whatever isn't gonna fall off. And the launch vehicle uh, says when to release these and the door opens up and they sort of all just stream out in whatever orbit it is that they're in at the time. Um, this, what you're seeing here is a Landsat 8 versus a CubeSat. So we see that uh, CubeSats are of course much, much smaller than, than the Landsat, but the CubeSats don't cost billions of dollars. But they have different goals, right? Like you're not gonna replace the Landsat series of satellites with CubeSats. Uh, Landsat, Sentinel, these are science quality data, whereas CubeSats are really made for shorter lifetimes, experimentation, um, rapid development uh, and of, of algorithms, um, and also, as we see, what Planet has done is that they can uh, put together a cheap constellation and image the Earth in a, in a much faster revisit time than we can with, with Landsat at a much lower cost. The CubeSats, of course, have a much lower lifespan. Um, they're in a much lower Earth orbit. Uh, this is actually interesting. It's cheaper 
because they're in that low Earth orbit, because they're not as subjected to the damaging rays of the sun. Uh, with Landsat and uh, satellites that are higher up in orbit, they need to have much more uh, protection, protective shielding, uh, and they have, of course, expensive star trackers uh, and much better hardware for the quality of the data. The CubeSats will last weeks to months, it says here, perhaps 18 months. Uh, Planet, ha I believe, has some in orbit that are four years old now. But you're generally not going to get much more than four to five years. So when you want to now take your data from your CubeSat and make an analysis ready, that cheaper hardware means relying on a lot more uh, intelligent, complicated software for the calibration and the correction. Uh, there's actually a great talk. It's not available yet, but it should be in the coming weeks from this ARD conference that was at Menlo Park in California earlier this month. Uh, and he talks about how um, software systems can be used to substitute for much more expensive hardware systems and the, and the challenges involved with making analysis-ready data from cheaper quality CubeSats. So you can actually go to CubeSatShop.com. So if you want to get a CubeSat, here you go. This is where you start. Uh, you can go there, you buy your satellite, you can buy an instrument, you can put that together, okay? And you can even go to Spaceflight.com or other alternatives and you can you can get your CubeSat launched. So uh, $350,000 is about the minimum that it's going to cost you, which is quite reasonable. Now, this makes it much more accessible uh, for universities, small businesses, the standardized buses, these standardized instruments. Uh, it means that buying commercial off-the-shelf CubeSats is a really legitimate option, and we have a much reduced barrier to entry. And we see that with the number of launches of nanosatellites uh, just since um, when they really started taking off in 2013. Uh, and we have a much, um, a, a great increase that we're expecting over the next four to five years. And if you look at the institutions that are actually launching these, we see that uh, there's a huge number of universities launching these things. Um, these are great educational tools. A university for right, fairly cheap can launch a satellite. They can keep that in orbit for a couple years. And um, the students can uh, learn a great deal from, from that entire process and, collecting the, and using collecting the data off of that. Of course, this means space debris is a potential problem. Now, when CubeSats are launched into low Earth orbit, they don't actually, when they reach the end of their lifespan, they, their orbits do de degrade and they burn up in the atmosphere. Uh, it's true, so they don't, so space debris created by uh, these nanosatellites aren't so much of a problem in and among themselves, uh, but while they're up there, they do create a great number of possible obstacles for other satellites, and so, um, you see here that uh, each of the LEO satellites operated by ESA has to perform a maneuver at least once a year just to avoid other stuff. And you saw that the increase in nanosatellites is going to go up. And so this is, uh, this can be, can, is going to become a, a major problem. So there's a wide variety of instruments available for these CubeSats. And so... Uh, we're, we're not just talking necessarily about optical. Um, Capella Space is, is, is putting up small sats that uh, have a SAR on board. Um, there's really a wide variety of instruments that are available. And so these require more diverse needs for processing the data. So you can imagine, though, that you're a university. You don't necessarily want to spend your whole entire time working on these, building these processing pipelines. You really just want the data. That's the important thing. You can build a processing pipeline with simulated data. Um, so like, that's not really all that novel. And so we created CubesatData.com. Uh, and it's a managed pipeline for processing and distributing, archiving uh, the, uh, the data from, from CubeSats using uh, something we call FilmDrop. So the name, of course, FilmDrop comes from back in the early days when satellites um, used to actually take film, and then drop it to the earth, where it would then be processed. So 
We start off with the CubeSat. That data goes on to, down to a ground station. This could be AWS has a new managed service called AWS Ground Stations, uh, or it could be uh, another ground station provider. This uh, data is then picked up in FilmDrop. It's archived. It's stored. It goes through a processing pipeline, and ultimately, uh, we have the discovery and access to the end user. So the uh, data is stored and indexed, and the, uh, we use open data, open standards for data wherever possible. Um, so this means stack. If you've not heard of stack, uh, I'll be giving a talk about that on Friday morning. And with the processing pipeline, uh, which I'll get into in a minute, you only write the processing functions. You don't have to actually worry about any of the scaling uh, or any of the deployment. You just write the processing functions, and FilmDrop will automatically will can deploy that and scale that depending on how many scenes in the bandwidth of the data. For processing, we use a library um, and open source project called Cumulus, which is something that NASA is currently working on. So NASA has 12 data centers throughout the United States, and that's where all of the NASA data gets processed through and distributed. They generally have themes like PODAC uh, is a physical oceanography, so all of the oceanograph oceanographic in, uh, data for NASA goes, goes processed through there. Uh, GHRC is for hydrology, uh, and so on. And so NASA used to maintain these data centers, uh, but logistically, there's all sorts of challenge there. You have to predict data usage, um, the hardware, you have to maintain the hardware. And so NASA is slowly moving to the cloud. And so the Cumulus framework is something that uh, has been developed um, with uh, Element 84 and Development Seed. And uh, it's open source project. Uh, you, can, you can go to it. It is, uh, I, do, I do warn you, it's quite complicated. Um, but when it's all working, it works pretty well. And so here we see uh, Cumulus offers several benefits. There's a dashboard built in so that operators, this is a, a diagram for how Cumulus works within the NASA framework, uh, but we have uh, taken this and modified it to use within CubeSatData.com and FilmDrop. Uh, so the operator has a dashboard. They can set up rules and set up collections in order to process data and control the flow of that data through the system and also be able to monitor it, rerun data when it fails, and, and be able to monitor failures as well. Uh, the data gets ingested. It's cataloged, and everything uses an API through it. So the dashboard is simply linking up to an API on the back end. Uh, so you can build additional tools off of this, and you're not relying just on necessarily the dashboard here. You can, you can build whatever tools you want to on top of the system. Uh, and the workflow there is uh, that's where the, the, the user is ultimately just going to provide the processing functions into the system. So Cumulus uh, is made up of several different steps, re these reusable components. So for instance, you can sync a granule, which means move it from one place, uh, like uh, bring it into the system, you process it, you move it to some sort of storage uh, location, long time storage, perhaps it's Glacier, uh, de depending on uh, the data access patterns. Uh, you move that granule to maybe a distribution site or something like that. And then here it says post to CMR, but in our case we actually post that to SAT API, which is a stack compliant uh, API. Uh, but the idea is the same, is that you're posting this metadata into your catalog so that now you can uh, access that from the front end. Uh, failures are all handled and logged throughout the system and accessible by the operator. So we have a pretty uh, robust scaling through this workflow. Uh, it handles uh, edge cases. In fact, that's actually uh, one of the major um, uh, efforts in Cumulus, as you can imagine, NASA processes a lot of data, and so really a lot of the work has been in being able to handle all sorts of really extreme edge cases and special cases uh, so that uh, failures and are, are well understood. 
The processing itself could run in a Lambda function if you meet the requirements of the Lambda, so within 15 minutes and you don't, uh, and you don't need more than uh, X amount of storage, uh, or you can use clusters as well. Uh, you deploy, um, you write your function, it's deployed as a Docker image, and then uh, that's automatically scaled up depending on how many tasks are in the queue, depending on the wait time of the queue, and, and so on. So here we have science developers, again, that can focus on just writing the actual processing code and not have to worry about uh, building and deploying the entire pipeline. So finally, we get to discovery and access. So, and this is really the important part that the end users are gonna be interested in uh, for searching, discovering, and visualizing this data. And so we use SAT API for that. Uh, SAT API is a stack compliant endpoint, and I'll be talking about that on Friday. Uh, if you've not heard of stack, um, you can use this yourself. It's open source. You can deploy this and ingest catalogs, uh, stack catalogs um, uh, fairly easily, and even keep them up to date by subscribing to SNS topics that uh, provide new data. So then, with everything in an API that's stack compliant, we can build all sorts of tools off this, so now we can have a front end. In this case, this is a SAT API browser, which is just, uh, it's um, recently released. It's just an alpha prototype by Development Seed. Um, so this could be your front end if you so cho um, choose. Uh, we've also at Element have developed various NASA tools like On Earth, uh, and these could be um, could prove as the basis for integrating into the API as well for the discovery, search, and access to, to the data, or the Earth Data Search Client, which we uh, are also involved in. Um, another interesting thing, uh, I will actually be talking about this tomorrow morning, uh, is um, there's uh, Pangeo is a community of scientists and stuff, but what I wanted to get across here is that you can also, the front end could be uh, also Jupyter Hub, where you're accessing cloud native data, and you're accessing the API, and you can run uh, algorithms and scale those up uh, because everything is using these open standards. Uh, and there we have FilmDrop. So we can see that uh, you know, most of this is, is based on uh, free and open source software. Uh, really, the, the bits that aren't are, are essentially the, what we use to deploy this uh, into the cloud infrastructure. Uh, and this really allows operators to focus on the mission and not have to worry about anything else. Uh, and it's critical, the open standards are critical to this entire process, as it really allows us to, uh, to, to build this out and build APIs and systems that can be easily integrated uh, and, and built upon and expanded. Uh, thank you. And also, I have stickers, too. So you can ask me. Um, I'm, and I'm right on time. We're actually back on time here, so uh, do, is, do we have any questions? Uh, right here. Uh, well, that's a, that's a great question. I have no idea what the answer is. The question was like, what responsibility do CubeSat uh, data pro providers, you know, launches have uh, on, on this? And of course, you can't launch anything into space just on your own. Uh, you need proper licensing and uh, places like Spaceflight will help you with that. Uh, and everything is licensed through NOAA is, is what, who handles all the licensing when things are launched. Um, but as far as the responsibility, I mean, I guess that's the responsibility is you have to go through a governing agency um, in, in, the, in the US, uh, but long term, I don't know, maybe we have all have a greater responsibility to, uh, try to work harder and think about um, what could be done to alleviate this problem, because it's only gonna become a, a bigger problem in the future. Uh, any other questions? Uh, thank you again. You get plenty of time to get to the next next talk. Thanks.